Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening. And I want to ask if you're listening to us on our website that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you'll find a link to subscribe directly to Acton Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. This week, I'm joined by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate, and Dylan Palman, executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at Acton. And this week, we're joined by a special guest, Mike Cosper. Mike is director of media at Christianity Today and the host of The Bulletin, Promised Land, and The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, all podcasts from Christianity Today. He is the author of Land of My Sojourn, which is in bookstores now. Most relevantly, he is the author of the essay, There Shall Be None to Make Him Afraid, American Liberty and the Jews, which is the cover essay in the spring 2024 issue of our magazine, Religion and Liberty. Religion and Liberty is available at select Barnes and Noble and Books a Million stores across the country, but you can save the time and trouble by subscribing to get our beautiful magazine in your mailbox four times per year for only $29.99. We'll include a link where you can subscribe in the show notes for today's episode, along with a link to Mike's essay. This week, we'll be discussing LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey and how we should think about her kind of throwback style of aggressive and possibly narcissistic leadership and squatters' rights. They exist on paper, but are they just and should they be legally ended? But first, I want to go to the magazine and that essay. Uh, and Mike, I'm just going to start very clearly here and simply and just ask you, tell us what your essay is about. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I set out quite a few months before, uh, October the 7th, um, thinking about some of these issues, thinking about the ways that, you know, the, the essay begins by looking at the way the world has changed in the last decade, because this summer marks a decade since the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I, I've been fascinated with, you know, we, we talk a, a lot about like the post, post-Trump post politics, and we talk a lot about post-George Floyd politics. Um, but, but I've been fascinated about the fact that like there, there really was this, this groundswell of conversation about race in America beginning around 20, 2014 and really beginning slightly before that, beginning with the death of, of Trayvon Martin in 2012. Um, and, and the, the fact that, you know, once people had smartphones in their pockets all the time, you started seeing more and more, um, you know, whether it was like, uh, target Karens yelling at, at, at people in the checkout or, you know, video of police brutality or just, it just everyday racism, right? Like it, racism became a conversation in America and and in a new way than it had been for most of you know my adult lifetime uh, up till then. So I had been thinking about these things for a long time. I'd been thinking about the way you'd seen this polarization um, around Black Lives Matter prior to the Trump thing. Post Trump, it it takes on a different flavor. Uh, Post George Floyd, it kind of iterates again. DEI comes into the mainstream, and what what interested me about all of these phenomenon and really kind of the, the, you know, you hear the polarization conversation all the time. What interested me in, in both of them is that they're ultimately destructive movements. They're, they're mostly interested in how do, you know, what's wrong with this country and how do we deconstruct it? And so the left wants to deconstruct, you know, our institutions that are power institutions and that use power to, you know, uh, enshrine a certain kind of racial hierarchy. Um, the right wants to undo what, the, whatever it is the left is doing, like it's make America great again. I, I say this in the essay, make America great again is actually a reactionary essay. They can't actually tell you what they want America to be. They don't want it to be what it's becoming. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a reactionary deconstructive kind of, kind of movement. So I, I proposed all of this, you know, I remember pitching, uh, pitching the essay prior to October the 7th and then post October the 7th, the whole conversation took on a very different flavor because of the surge of anti-Semitism on the, on the far left and and then on the far right as well. And, and, and to me, that just underscored the, the core point that, 
that when political movements are about deconstruction, when political movements are reactionary, um, they reveal themselves in in ugly ways. And in particular, the fact that the far right and the far left are revealing themselves in this in this ugly anti-Semitic way, uh, I, I just thought it was very telling about how how dangerous they both are, and and I think how how disgusted most of the people who sort of live in the middle of this and are shrugging their shoulders going what how you know how, how do we how do we stay out of this um how, how disgusted it we, we truly are were you surprised by the surge of anti-semitism that we saw post october 7 and i mean really some of it we saw October 8. I mean, there were rallies in the streets and major cities that are quite arguably were infused with anti-Semitism almost immediately afterwards. You talk in the essay about you know, Jews being the canaries in the coal mine for threat, greater threats. Um, you know, Barry Weiss's own summation, what starts with the Jews rarely ever ends with the Jews. I, I talked to, uh, I got a couple episodes of Act in Line that we'll put into the, the show notes here. One on anti-Semitism in general with a rabbi friend of mine, Jonathan Greenberg, just to ask why why do people hate the Jews? And then another exploring the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. We'll put both of those in there. Um, but were, were you surprised by just how quickly that happened and how virulent it seemed to be? I think, I think it was, a, that's a, my answer to that is a no and a yes. No in the sense that for, for much of my adult life, I've been fascinated by the subject of anti-Semitism because of its, you know, because of its recurrence as a um, sort of a cultural poison uh, every every other generation or so. Uh, you see, you know, whether it's, you know, I mean, part of what's fascinating about anti-Semitism is that it, it's, it's shape-shifting ability. So for communists, um, the the Jews were a problem because the the Jews were all the the bourgeoisie and and they needed to be you know driven out um, because they were keeping the proletariat down. For the Nazis, the Jews were a problem because they were all communists and they were undermining you know the Reich and so on and so forth. And you see that over and over again. You know, there's a great book called Anti Judaism that really looks at this as a historic theme of the 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 Jewish people's. Um, in in the in the cultural imagination, the shape shifting power of Jews to sort of embody whatever the evil is of a of a given moment. Um, so all that to say, I wasn't surprised that it's there, and I wasn't surprised. It, there's a sense in which I'm not surprised that it's pervasive. We we knew it was on the right, right? We saw we all saw Charlottesville. You know, Jews will not replace us. Like, you know, they meant that, right? Um, and and to a certain extent, if you followed uh, the the Israel Palestine debate over the last couple of decades, you knew that there was this uh, settler colonialist ideology stuff at the at the college campus level that had taken hold in a really in a really significant way. So I wasn't surprised that it was there. I was surprised at how unabashed and violent it was, and I was very surprised at our political leaders and kind of cultural elites. Um, particularly on the left, who who have not really had the courage to call this stuff what it is. I mean, they're so afraid of, um, you know, straight like like the Biden being the most obvious example of this, but it really flows from down from him. They're so af afraid of that online energy, that sort of youthful activist energy, um, that they let it they let it fester in ways that you know. They brought down Claudine Gay, and and it would not surprise me to see Israel being a significant issue in in November that gets Trump reelected because you know if if Biden doesn't stand up to the you know if he doesn't have his quote unquote sister soldier moment I know that's a cliche at this point but if he doesn't on on this issue I think that could really really hurt him in the fall. I mean, Pope Pius IX used to say that modernism was the synthesis of all heresies. And I think of anti-Semitism in a similar sort of way as the synthesis of all bigotries. Um, this is something that, you know, everyone can pour their grievance into. Rabbi Mitch Rockland, who has given numerous talks for Acton over the years, talks about a lot of anti-Semitism being wrapped up in opposition to modernity and particularly to commercial societies is that you see this in the Middle Ages. This is often linked 
with um, this sort of anti-commercial, anti-merchant uh, thinking. You see this in Shakespeare, you know, Merchant of Venice, these classic sort of narratives. Um, and I think, you know, you have also what you have in October 7th is you have the Israeli-Palestine conflict on people's minds, and this is a convenient smokescreen for anti-Semitism. Oftentimes, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is longstanding, it's complicated, and I think there are people, people can have good faith differences about how that conflict can best be resolved. However, anti-Semites seize on this conflict to as an entry point w where they express an opposition to Zionism as an ideological project, but that is a smokescreen for introducing this anti-Semitic discourse. And you see this, you see this again and again. You see this with Jeremy Corbyn, former leader of the Labour Party in England. Again, like all of this is framed along this sort of colonial resistance, but then you know you get you know. You get artwork presenting Jews as, you know, the puppet masters behind international capital um, following right on the heels of that. Um, and I think I think I think that's why, particularly after October 7th, you see a new energy here because these people see this conflict as a chance to insert uh, anti-Semitism into a public conversation under the smoke screen of a discussion about geopolitical conflict. I think too, just to tag on that, I think there's, um, you know, if, if we want to sort of position it in, in the context of modernity, one of the things to look at as well is that the modern world, like, like secularism creates this moral anxiety for most people because we're moral beings and we're looking for, a, 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 we're looking for opportunities to express a sense of moral indignation, a sense of righteousness, whatever you want to call it. And that gets really confusing when you're living in a liberal society, a pluralistic society where, where that stuff um, seems to kind of flatten out, right? And so it, when you can when you can define a situation with heroes and villains, or like if you want to get Girardian and talk about scapegoats, like Jews make great scapegoats in modernity. And 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 um and so I think that's another reason people seize on this conflict is because for, for reasons that I think are overtly anti-Semitic and like inadvertently anti-Semitic, there you have this consensus around the idea that Israel is bad and the Palestinians are the perpetual victims of this conflict. And and so signing on to the pro-Palestinian cause comes with a certain sense of righteous indignation and moral, you know. Like, like it's there, there's something morally affirming in yourself when you when you kind of sign into that cause. So, so that's part of why you see this consensus across um, elite academics and the NGO world and everything else that that flattens out this conflict in a way that that actually, when you then get into the brass tacks of like, well, what's gone on over the last, particularly the last twenty five years, you know, it it doesn't the, the calculus doesn't actually make make sense anymore. Um, so I think a lot of the attraction and, and a lot of the power behind this is that actually is almost like a religious impulse to, you know, looking for a, a moralism. And, and it's why the world centers on the conflict as well, because, because among that tribe, right, they can agree about that. I mean, that's why Matty Friedman had a great essay in the free press talking about the, the press coverage on this. There, the, the AP has more has over the years, I don't know what the situation is now, but the AP generally has more people assigned to Israel um, than all of China and all of Russia combined, <laughs> which, which is extraordinary when you think about, you know, how much actual influence, how much economic influence um, these places have on our lives. Yeah, I was on a panel with Eric, uh, a couple months ago, in which we we talked about this conflict, it was a local Chicago area program, and while this was while this was going on, we were talking about this, and you know, this is something you know, 
you had at the time a refugee crisis in Pakistan where the government was proposing to literally move millions and millions of people from Pakistan back into Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, a humanitarian tragedy. There was no sense of the, the disparity in coverage. And, you know, I mean, this is not to say that what is going on in Gaza right now, it merits media attention. Does it the, – the media sort of monopolization that comes with it is something that, yeah, you, you know, I think, I think part of this is anti-Semitism. And part of this is, is you know, anti-Semitism has found institutional homes throughout the 19th and 20th century through state-sponsored agents, whether they be Tsarist Russia, whether they be National Socialist Germany, or whether they be sort of Nasser's Egypt. And there have been a successor throughout history – of regimes that have been interested in seizing upon um, any conflict in the world and amplifying um, their own interests in those conflicts by weaponizing anti-Semitism. I think of this, um, to, to get at the more positive side, I, th I believe Mike Yardy sort of mentioned as, you know, that sometimes anti-Semitism is really just the the form that that anti-bourgeois you know kind of mentality takes um I think in the modern world of course there was anti-Semitism before the modern world um but in the modern world um often it's a stand in or it's uh, it's it's encouraged by um people who just don't believe in this discovery of commercial society that we have in the modern era, that there's actually a positive sum nature to a pluralistic social life. Um, and when people feel excluded by that, or when they only view the world in zero sum terms and winners and losers, they look for escaping. Um, and, you know, historically, again, in part due to that medieval anti-Semitism, Jewish people have been able to adapt very well to commercial society. Um, and and you know develop the survival skills you need to to thrive in, in that environment, and then they become just the the stand-ins, right? The the scapegoats for uh, people in situations, you know, people who genuinely think America is not great anymore. Um, people who um, really feel that uh, the whole game is rigged against them. Uh, That's casino capitalism or whatever, and they're looking for someone to blame. Um, and I think, you know, part of it, you could you could try to point out, you know, the illogical nature of anti-Semitism to people. But uh, as I'm fond of quoting, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, once mentioned, speaking of anti-Semites, uh, they know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves. For it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. Um, the anti-Semite is in a ridiculous position, I think, always. And I think there's this dilemma of the person who believes in positive sum social life, who believes in the goodness of commercial society, is a lot harder to build than tear down. As you mentioned, you have all these reactionary movements that, you know, what do you know? They're embracing anti-Semitism as soon as the opportunity crops up. It's really easy to point the finger at it's all their fault everything bad in your life it's them we just got to get rid of them and then everything will be better um that's magical thinking that there, there's no logic to it um and i think there's a, a difficulty that it's not just a matter of showing people that that is silly because it is um but the people who are really buying into it are doing so from a desperate point of view, maybe an illogically desperate point of view, um, but it's a symptom of uh, a sense of exclusion and a sense of, you know, the world having failed someone. And so they they lash out. And what do you know? The Internet and history is full of this one conspiracy. I mean, there's other ones, too, um, but this one is a popular one and it keeps coming up. Um, and so I, I'm curious if you could talk more about some of the groups that Embrace this. Some of the people, maybe more on the edges, who are tempted, who maybe are, are seem more surprising uh, that they might buy into this sort of thing. 
um, because I do think there's there's something deeper. It's it's really easy just to if you're not anti-Semitic to say, well, that's that's stupid and bigoted. Why would anybody ever buy into that? Uh, well, there are reasons why people buy into that. They might not be good reasons, but yeah, I think there's there's a there's a, a deeper social malaise uh, that that deserves a, a diagnosis. Yeah. No, I think that's a. I think that's a, such an important point because you know when you when you see, particularly when you see this these kinds of eruptions at at college campuses, um, there is this tendency to, uh, to to sort of roll your eyes and go, "Man, these idiot college kids!" And of course, you got all you have all the like gotcha social media videos, which 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 have a point. Like it's not to say the point is invalid. Where they'll they'll interview they'll go to one of these protests and they'll say you're saying from the river to the sea which river and which sea and of course like most of the people that they interview don't know the the river to the sea or they'll they'll go up to someone holding a sign that says like queers for Palestine and they'll they'll say well tell me about what it's like for gay people living in Palestine now and they have no idea you know the the situation what what what's what what I what I don't like about that kind of coverage of all this stuff even again even though i think that stuff has a point what i don't love about it is um is that it kind of masks exactly what you're talking about in terms of like why are those people showing up to these rallies in the first place what is it that's motivating them to get there what is it that they're that they're in search of and so i think some of that is this um you know the the the, the, the kind of a hobby horse of of someone like me who who looks at this and says like man in a secular society people who who have a, a loss of meaning they are they are desperately looking for meaning some somewhere they're you know and if you and if you think about young people um who are hearing like the planet is about to explode from uh from our environmental abuses um our economies are about to collapse because of uh, you know, whatever the the cause du jour is or the crisis du jour is around AI or any of that kind of stuff. Um, look, you know, they, they're they looking for an outlet for rage and 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 looking for an outlet for moral rage in, in a world that doesn't provide a lot of outlets for moral rage. Um, so, yeah, so the lack of that sort of, the lack of that sort of positive constructive vision for them like what are, what are you going to give your life to that has meaning and that has that has value um that's i mean that's that's where ideological mo- movements always take root and they and they get ugly very quickly um when when people are sort of lost like that uh, that's the whole you know that's that's the whole history of totalitarianism those rootless societies lonely people loss of purpose loss of a sense of opportunity loss of a sense of a future and someone comes in and says, you know, the real problem here is, is this one thing. If we can just solve this one thing, then utopia is on the horizon. And I think in a, in a story like this where you, you know, where, where, where you have this ideology of uh, around sort of in, indigeneity and, and race and it's, you know, it's, it's connected to sort of because of intersectionality, it's connected to sexuality in these different ways. Um, you, you can understand why people get young people especially get so passionate so quickly. Um, but, but in order to do that, you have to just distort, you have to distort reality and history in really dramatic ways. Dylan, you reminded me of part of the answer that I got when I asked Jonathan Greenberg, why do people hate the Jews? And, and part of it is that it's like an, it's an overdetermined phenomenon. Um, there's all kinds of, of different reasons, but one of them was just the kind of, it is a small and identifiable group of people who also seem to have a disproportionate sense of fame, success, notoriety, uh, along with them, at least in the modern world, in our modern uh, way of looking at things. And Mike, you have this, it, describe it as a canary in a coal mine. I guess the, the, uh, you know, the other way to analogize it might be kind of, there's also kind of a Rorschach test element to it as well, where he kind of even hinted at this, what Dylan said, I think you're absolutely right about, you know, the, the, uh, their position within a commercial society and people viewing this as zero sum and, and not a positive sum game. But you have this interesting thing where you have like, you know, again, Jews as the enemies because they are capitalists, because they are wealthy and because they control everything and then Jews as the enemies because they were communists or socialists at different point in time. And it just shows you that it's just, it, it is a, it, it is the projection of a lot of different things and a lot of different hatreds 
into and onto this one group of people, irrespective of the facts and the reality um, that may undergird that. I think it's that's, you know, to your point of trying to make sense of this, you know, trying to argue with people who have these positions in an earnest way is a fool's errand because they're going to act irresponsibly. And if you are going to bind yourself by, you know, realities, numbers, data, anything like that, then you're making a fool of yourself in the face of people who are willing to be ridiculous and frivolous and argue absurdities, no matter what the underlying truth may be. So I think, I think this is right. And I think there's, there's interesting when you talk about college campuses, part of this is people have been primed for very, for this particular kind of access. This is, you know, I am a geriatric millennial and as going through the standard American public high school curriculum, you know, the things that were lionized were social movements. You know, this was very, this is a departure, you know, early days, you know, of America, you have these sort of great men who figure prominently or are sort of the animating forces of history and progress in the textbooks. There are problems with that. But I think there's also a problem when you reduce um, the greatness in history to the pros to uh, abstract social movements, and we talk about these movements in terms of the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, anti-colonial struggles around the world. We talk about it in terms of you know, particularly in a sort of post-Obergefell world, the gay rights movement. Now, all of these social movements factor into history. But when you walk out of sort of the standard educational priming you get as an American in the 21st century and walk into a culture, into a college campus, you're told that the way that you make a difference, you've been, you've been taught all your life, is the way you make a difference in the world is through participation in these sorts of movements. It's by going to rallies. It's by organizing sit-ins. Now, there is a time and a place for rallies, sit-ins, that sort of participation in civil life, but there's also a time for, you know, like raising a family to make a difference or working out your vocation or, you know, making a scientific contribution. But I think too many young people today, they think like, you know, the cause and meaning of life is about being on the right side of history. And if there is someone rallying you to something using that sort of language, I think it's very compelling for young people today. Mike, I'm curious if you'd, you'd dilate a little bit. Feel free to, to respond to what Dan was just saying there as well. But I, I was curious if you'd dilate a little bit on this. Would you quote here from George Washington and the letters that he sent to Jewish congregations uh, when, when he was the first president of the United States? I'll read from a passage here. In 1790, a year after George Washington was sworn into office, he received three letters of congratulation from Jewish congregations around the new nation. Washington replied to each one, expressing his gratitude, not only for their words, but also for the safe harbor they'd found in the new nation. His hope was that, in this way, America would be a model to the nations of healthy liberalism. I'm wondering if your thoughts on, as we see that, you go back to the horseshoe problem, right? It's it's different attacks on liberalism from different directions now, as it's liberalism that has come to be assailed. Is is this kind of opened the possibility for America, which has always been um, philo-Semitic instead of anti-Semitic as a nation? It has really been the exception. It has been this incredible place where Jews have been able to live as Jews and prosper. Um, I'll, uh, now that I meant mention it, I'll throw into the show notes as well, a, a great essay from John Podhoritz at Commentary on how this kind of era is coming to an end. Is it the attacks on liberalism and the anti-liberalism rising on both left and right that is kind of priming the ground for what we're, we're seeing now? I think so. I mean, I mean, I think, I think the common root um, for, for, for all of this is, um, you know, to a certain extent, the common root to all of this is the erosion of any of any connection to anything meaningful, um, you know, and, and again, like back to the back to the kind of secularism conversation, right? Like when you don't have a sense of rootedness in meaning, either in family or religion or vocation or anything, it, it, when you've lost that sense of 
of kind of transcendent purpose, then then again, the power of ideology is that it it gives you a simulacrum of that. It gives you a simulacrum of the of the sense of more moral purpose and moral meaning. Um, it it gives you a, a it gives you a sense of connection that's very that feels very similar to like like being part of a movement feels similar to being part of a religious community in a lot of ways um, because it's got a lot of that energy. It has a kind of transcendent sense because there's an eschatology to it of of where the movement is going and and what it's going to look like down the line. Like all the stuff you were saying, Dan, a moment ago about activism, like that's that's uh, that's an incredibly powerful impulse. Um, the problem. Um, the problem is because they they aren't rooted. I mean, what you see in the last 250 years of these kind of ideological movements is they always collapse. Um, they always collapse because they they they're not built. They're not institutions. They don't have a history. Um, they're not rooted in transcendent meaning, and so they can't sustain themselves for the long haul. And um, and then the the aftermath of that is always is always disastrous as well. Um, I think the contrast, I mean, I think the the contrast with with liberalism, like part of what's part of what's brilliant about the American founding and the American project was was the idea of its of its limitations. and And one of the things I love about those those letters um, that Washington writes is, if you read the original letters to them, it's almost kind of this like thank you note, sort of like, hey, listen, like we're really glad we're here. And we're really glad you're putting up with us. This is, you know, it was a bad time. It was already a bad time to be a Jew in in Europe um, by then. And and you're you're seeing in the in the 200 years that follow the way an Israeli journalist Haviv Retigur put it this way. He said, in in the last 200 250 years, the history of most of the Jews in the world was learning English, learning Hebrew, or dying. And and that's really starting to to begin there. Um, at the time of the founding, and it surges in the next hundred years, and so they were writing and they were saying, "Hey, thanks for putting up with us. You know, thanks for ho- holding out a little space for us here. We're really glad to be Jews and Americans." And essentially, what Washington is writing back to them is saying, "No, no, no, no. I'm not holding out a space for you. This country is yours. It's yours as much as it's mine. The promises of liberty are as true for you as they are for me. You're not a." an exception to the American promise where we, where we've carved out a little space for you, you are part of the American promise just as everyone, you know, just as everyone else who comes to this country is. Um, What's, what's difficult for that, I think in, in the moment we're in now where identity has become connected to morality in all of these various ways is that it becomes really like once you moralize identity then the idea that you would have sort of equal admission, equal protection, the, the, the very notion of pluralism becomes kind of ugly and poisonous because um, because you don't want pluralism with people who by their very nature, because they're Jews or because they're white or because they're black or whatever the, the you know, whatever your biases are, um, because they're inherently evil. Uh, pluralism you know, pluralism doesn't allow for that, and I think that's that's part of what we've seen in in the you know the identity politics of, of the last five five ten years. Mike, I want to ask you one more question as as someone at Christianity Today, observing kind of the the landscape of of the Christian universe. Um, you had this controversy. I remember writing it in in the margin here in one of the sections on this the section on canaries in the coal mine. Um, what do you make of the reaction of most of of the Christian world to what has been going on since October seven? Uh, I know you document some of this in the, the podcast series you're working on right now called Promised Land. Uh, the other reason I want to bring it up is because you had this what I found to be just intractably stupid debate over whether it is appropriate for Christians to say Christ is King. Um, which, of course, for Christians is a true statement, but context matters, and much of the context in which a lot of that was being said was in a way to kind of insinuate some anti-Semitism that, like, you know, Jews have got it wrong because they don't believe that uh, that Christ is king. Um, what, what do you make of just the general Christian landscape as you survey it and, and of that specific debate, which, again, I bring up all 
also because you you were really forecasting well here in in this essay, which of course was written a little while ago. Because you have you do have a name check mention in there of uh, of one Candace Owens, who, as you wrote in there at the time, was at the Daily Wire, is no longer at the Daily Wire, and is probably the person we could focus most on for this epidemic of uh, again an intractably dumb argument over whether it's appropriate or not to say that Christ is King. Yeah. Well, I mean, I am fascinated by the landscape among evangelicals right now um, with with the Israel Palestine story because it's it's dramatically different than it was 20, 25 years ago. 25 years ago, you know, support for Israel was just through the roof. 85, 90 something percent um, would have said, you know, we support Israel kind of no matter what. Um, this there was this sense of continuity in terms of uh, uh, Israel is God's chosen people, et cetera. Um, there was a there was a theological sense to it. There was also the Cold War mentality was still kind of baked in. I think there's a lot of factors that have have contributed to that. So I'll mention one, and then we'll jump over to the other. Like um, one that is fascinating is there is this erosion of of support for Israel or or concern for Israel that I think comes from two significant factors. One is that. Christian, the, the Christian Academy is no, in some ways, um, not much different than elite academies in the degree to which it's been influenced by uh, decolonization ideology, right? And so a lot of the a lot of the sentiment and mentality around colonialism has been embraced on Christian campuses and in Christian environments, um, particularly elite Christian universities. Um, that that have communicated a lot of the same things. And there's a whole Palestinian Christian movement that comes mostly out of Bethlehem, um, led primarily by figures like Munther Isaac and, and to, to a lesser extent, Jack Sarah, um, that have advanced that decolonization narrative in a way that's very hostile to Israel, that's often that often tra- um, traffics in anti-Semitic imagery and tropes. And that has made younger generations much more suspicious of Israel, if not outright hostile to, to Israel. And that's big. And that's something we've we've documented a bit on the podcast. And I think it's I think it's something to pay attention to. Um, the other factor that I think has influenced that erosion is just left behind. I think left behind was like the the one of the biggest books in the world 25 years ago. And it kind of fetishized Israel and it and it created this sort of weird Christian romance around um around you know end times theology and all the rest of it. And boomers loved it and they bought it and they bought the movies and all of that. And I think Gen Xers and millennials were kind of embarrassed by it. So they stopped talking about the the mo- the modern state of Israel and they stopped sort of looking at those theologies and addressing them in their churches in in constructive ways. Um, and so, if you just don't talk about anything forever, then there, in a vacuum, something will fill it. And I think some of the sort of more latent, hostile um, uh, energy around Israel filled it. On the right, yeah, I mean, already by the t- you know when I was writing this, I think back in in December, January, um, already you had this stuff coming from from Candace Owens and and others who were. Uh, sort of in the name of of nationalism, America first, you know, uh, saying saying I, I don't know about all of this, but but that was all just sort of prelude to much more open an- anti semitism that's emerged later. With well, you know, the the Jews are really in control of everything, and they're they're running the media, and they're doing they're doing this that and the other. I mean, my my running joke on the on the Christ is King thing is that it just it just reminds me of. Uh, of the Big Lebowski, um, the the great line to Walter Sobchak: "You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an a hole." Right? <laughs> like that's <laughs> it, it's it's the schoolyard kid who's saying nyet 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 nyet. You know, when they're saying Christ is King, like you're not saying that because you're saying this out of your devotion. You're saying it in the face of people that you hate, and it's so obvious. And we all know you're doing it, and and. And it's, it, I, I mean, there's, there's part of me that didn't even, I, I didn't even comment on it online because I just felt like, I, I don't want to just, I don't want to give any more oxygen to the gaslighting of, well, what are you talking about? I'm just, I'm just asking questions. I'm just praising the Lord over here, and you're, look at, you know, it's just silly. It's so dumb. 
Yeah, it, it, it reminded me of uh, a great quip from Ross Douthat that I may need to expand on now is like if you uh, if you disliked the uh, the Christian right, wait till you see the post-Christian right. Well, maybe now wait till you see the post-Christian Christian right, um, right with the way that some of those people have been acting. This was very much reminded me of um, uh, similar patterns of, of taunting in who in uh, Hindu nationalist circles, particularly with the recent construction of the Ayodhya temple over what had been for centuries a mosque. You know, you had young people, you know, shouting and baiting with, you know, chants of Joshri Ram, of, you know, of a celebration of Ram, whose birthplace is, uh, you know, was on the grounds of the Ayodhya temple. And it was, it's, it's strange to see this, this working itself out cross-culturally in identity politics um, with different uh, insincere ex- acclamations. I want to move on to our second topic. Yesterday, South Carolina's women's basketball team defeated Iowa to win the NCAA Women's National Championship. A week earlier, Iowa, led by Caitlin Clark, arguably the greatest women's college basketball player of all time, defeated Louisiana State University 94-87. to LSU had defeated Iowa in the championship game last year to win the women's national championship. LSU is coached by Kim Mulkey, uh, who is an interesting and very colorful, both figuratively and literally, if you have ever seen her on the sideline of an LSU women's college basketball game. She is quite flamboyant in her dress choices uh, and an interesting personality. She had preempted a piece that was coming out from the Washington Post at a press conference uh, doing what is a was going to be familiar to a lot of people of assailing the the journalist and the journalistic institution as a hit piece as fake news before anybody ever had a chance to read it. Now, of course, Kim Mulkey very well may have had an idea of what was going to be in the piece if a reporter is digging around for that long, they have undoubtedly contacted her for comment on the piece, and undoubtedly she was aware of the other people they were talking to as well. The piece itself explores her relationships not only with her family, but also with players at her current and former uh, university. She was at Baylor previously. And uh, undoubtedly, you can consider her to be quite a controversial figure. She defended Baylor in the face of accusations, which um, were quite well justified, of uh, covering up for sexual assault that happened at that university. And she's in many ways, uh, you know, reminiscent of a different era of coaching. Uh, Mike, I'm I'm glad that this timed out very well, because one of the first things that I thought of was in uh, the podcast that you'd produced, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. There's an episode in which you examine someone who seems to be very much a template in which Kim Mulkey is operating, and that is Bobby Knight, who is the men's basketball coach at Indiana. She seems kind of to be a version of, of that. Um, given the amount of time you spent examining leadership, um, you know, not only the Bobby Knight example, but that as a way to inform the conversation that was going on about Mark Driscoll and church leadership within the evangelical world, there are people who romanticize the kind of leadership that Bobby Knight and Kim Mulkey bring to a basketball team like that. They're not friends with their players. They are an authority figure. Um, I'm always reminded, I'm, you know, I, I like basketball, but I'm much more of a hockey fan. If you've ever seen the, the Disney movie Miracle about the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team, Herb Brooks, who coached that team, says, you know, like, I'll be your coach. I won't be your friend. If you need one of those, take it up with the assistant coach or the doctor. Uh, And even players said, like, until the day that he died tragically in a car accident, he never became friendly with any of the players from that 1980 Olympic team, uh, despite, of course, those being people who had walked through history forever defeating the Soviet Union in the the way that they did and becoming legends. Um, So, Mike, what did you make of this this piece about Kim Mulkey and uh, the the way— the style of leadership that she seems to embody and express and the romanticism that exists around those kinds of leaders and almost in a, you know, I don't want to politicize this too much, but like a, the make America great again kind of approach that says, you know, we used to be, 
we, the authoritative lines used to be clear and people used to be able to be tough and they used to be able to like Mike, um, like Bobby Knight did drag the best out of the players that he had by being the really tough kind of coach. And we're getting soft as, as a nation. And we see that in, in the way that a lot of the coach player relationships exist now. Yeah. Well, first off, kudos to Kent Babb who wrote this piece for the post. This is just a brilliant piece. It's a brilliant bit of writing and reporting. Um, one of those things that just reminds me like why, like my favorite writing is always like great sports journalism that gets you in the heads of these people like this. Cause it's just, it's just so engrossing. Um, and I thought, I mean, you know, I, what I actually immediately thought was, you know, when Bobby Knight a few years ago, he said, you know, when they bury, when, when, when I die, bury me upside down so my critics can kiss my rear end. Um, it reminded me of that. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I grew up, spent most of my childhood in Indiana. So, so Bobby Knight was always sort of top of mind for us and, and was living there when the, when the controversy uh, came around that, that led to his end at IU. Um, I, I have to say, like, I have complicated feelings about these stories, right? Because there are, there are, there are figures who get, I mean, I think in, in a social media era, there are figures who sort of cosplay at this kind of um, this kind of mindset, this kind of drill sergeant attitude or whatever, and they do it online and they do it on Twitter. But when you look at their lives, they haven't actually ever done anything, right? Like they've never actually led anything. They've never they, they've never actually sort of achieved anything. Like Kim Mulkey didn't wear this persona as a as a garb, so to speak, to to, to garner attention. Um, Kim Mulkey is obsessed with basketball and has given everything to being obsessed obsessed with basketball. And everyone in her life kind of knows that. Like she has that singular mindset. Um and and I remember, I mean, another quote I, I thought of as I was reading it is as I think it was Richard Pryor who once said of you know, stand-up comics, um, he said, you know, uh, happy, well-adjusted people don't get into this business. I mean, I think happy, well-adjusted people don't become that kind of coach. Like, you you can't achieve the things that Bobby Knight did without, or or, or Haruki Murakami's line in in um, what I talk about when I talk about running. When he talks about running these ultra marathons, he's like, anybody who runs that hard is running from something. Like, so the psychology of it is is fascinating to me. But the fact that the the fact that it results in what it results in is is so interesting too. And you get these mixed you get these mixed reports from her players, some of whom were like, you know, yeah, she she was a bully and I had to leave. And then and then some who were like, I have no complaints about I have no complaints about her whatsoever. You know, because uh, people like to win. So so I don't know. I mean, I I feel conflicted about it because on the one hand, obviously. I'm, you know, I spent a couple of years on this this project about Mark Driscoll and the rise and fall of Mars Hill. This is a pastor. This is a very different role that a pastor is supposed to be playing in the life of of a culture and of a society. And I and I think that there are real problems there. Um, I don't feel like I, I know enough about this one to judge one way or the other, except from reading the story. I do find it so interesting. But I think in a in a moment where we're talking so much about bullying. And trauma and um and and sensitivity around these issues. I think at some point we also have to start a conversation about, well, what about grit and resilience, right? Like what do we do what what do we do on the other side of trauma? What do we do on the other side of of bullying or whatever? Because a lot of players, I imagine, came into her came into her environment. And they found the discipline and the structure and the 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 drive from Mulkey that says, no, you can get up and you can do another sprint because I need you to do that sprint now because you're going to need to do it in the game. They they were affirmed by that. They found something in them they didn't know was there. So anyway, all that to say, I, I find it utterly fascinating. And I think we've got to start having a cultural conversation where we don't automatically, and again, I don't know enough to, about the situation to make a judgment fully, but we don't automatically take somebody who's hard-nosed like this and, and turn them into a villain because we need a conversation about grit and resilience as well. 
Um, we need people in our culture who can push us that extra mile, that extra, you know, the extra effort, the extra push. Um, we need people who are obsessives because obsessives draw out the the best in us and draw out brilliant things from from uh, from our imaginations. I mean, Steve Jobs shows up and says, "I want a phone with no buttons," and they, you know, the engineers want to laugh him out of the room, but he was right, right? Um, anyway. So I think, you know, I mean, leadership is about people and people respond differently to different sorts of incentives, to different sorts of structures. Um, LSU is one basketball program among many. There may be certain players that will not thrive in a program like that. And they'd be better served by going to one of the many other NCAA schools that, that, that you know, offer a different sort of basketball program. But I am the kind of person that responds to this sort of leadership. You know, my greatest, you know, as I was reading this story, I was thinking, you know, I had a Latin professor who was a former, uh, former uh, Benedictine monk who, um, or Latin teacher, this is high school, um, who would, uh, I saw him once give someone a negative score on an exam because he would, he would give us words to conjugate this sort of thing. And he had misspelled ablative, but had otherwise left everything blank. So he got, he got negative 2% for the misspelling of ablative. Um, you know, there's the great yoga teacher, BKS Iyengar, you know, who's, you know, notoriously, you know, one of his first classes, a woman brings together a group of friends to have a class and, uh, you know, they go on for, for three, four hours and he asks her, you know, when would you like the next class? And she goes, well, that depends because I'm going to have to gather an entirely new group of friends because none of these ladies will be back for this again. But, you know, when people tell these stories, they're like, oh, he used to be so much worse and it was better. Like, that's the sort of thing you get over and over. And it's not for everyone. It's not. Um, and in a church context, Church is supposed to be for everyone, so it's a different situation. But when you're talking about a basketball program, when you're talking about a company, when you're talking about um, an educational environment, um, those are different. And I think I think this sort of leadership, certain people uh, rise to that occasion. And uh, I think uh, it's wrong to just devalue and dismiss it or to, or to criticize it or to think of it in terms of mere bullying um, because there is a result here. Um, this isn't this isn't, you know, just a group of women that the coach is randomly assigned to whom she berates for no reason. Um, this is about winning basketball games. Well, I, I've been thinking this over, and it's definitely uh, this is a, a coaching style that I do not think I would thrive under. Um, I am probably the opposite of Dan in that case. Although I, I respect anyone who will defend the honor of the ablative case. Um, but uh, that said, uh, we we have an institution in this country that thrives on this. It's called actual boot camp. Um, we, we have a military and uh, one of the ways in which it thrives uh, is that everyone is equalized through this process of incredibly harsh discipline, of pushing people beyond their limits, uh, physically, of singling people out um, and, you know, exposing them to public shame uh, when, when they fail. Um, and that's not always good for everyone, as, as others have pointed out. Um, but to, to just only look at the positive side of it, positive in the sense of uh, the people who go through it and say, no, that was good for me, um, even though it is harsh on uh, to an outsider. Um, I, I think that's part of it. So you have this common sort of struggle that everyone becomes a part of. Um, and that that builds a team. Right. Builds builds a, a troop, an army, um, and it can build a team. Um, but it, it's interesting that I think I think the circumstances in which that works um, are conditional in different ways. So Dan mentioned I, it doesn't work for the whole church, um, but I would argue that it, it does work for some monasteries. Right. Um, there are some people who they want to be, you know, the church militant as almost literally as they can. I mean, it's not in the Middle Ages anymore, so you can't join a militant order, but um, but there are still orders 
you can join, you can submit yourself to very strict discipline and very, um, you know, severe obedience uh, to an elder. Um, and people choose that. People want that. They want that st- structure. Um, they want that shared suffering that builds them into a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Um, and and there is something valuable in that. Um, I think it's interesting, though, and, and those who are more up on this can correct me, but it seems that this sort of coaching style is more prevalent uh, in college, in Olympics, um, it is this the sort of thing you find in the NBA? Um, because I kind of think not, right? You need it in like you need that that position on the team in college. Um, in the Olympics, you're competing to be best in the world. You're going for the honor of your country and you're not getting paid, right? Or at least you weren't. Uh, I don't know if you, that's still the case, but I know for a while you couldn't even be a professional athlete, and then you also weren't getting paid. Um, whereas in the NBA, if you don't like the coach, you can just say, well, I'll just go to the other team that'll pay me $20 million to, you know, fall down at the end and get the, the foul that wins the game. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like it, it, you, you have that, the coach doesn't have as much leverage to behave in that way. Uh, and I wonder, I wonder if the kind of the conditions of the age, the, the need of the athlete, you have to do well in college if you want to be Six, you know, make it into the NBA or the WNBA or whatever professional league. Um, but once you're in, um, now people are bidding for you. It's an entirely different dynamic. Um, so I don't know if I have much of a, a question or anything, but well, these, these are sort of the thoughts that, that came to me reading this piece. It, you know, it's interesting. Her father had a military background. She, you know, absorbed that. She had a coach that was, you know, very much in this style. And she excelled in that environment. Um, and then that's what she does. And she does that for other people. Um, and, you know, doesn't mean it's not, not always good. Doesn't mean it never gets into a toxic, narcissistic sort of zone. I think that's a real concern. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. And uh, I think there there's a, a need for prudence in looking at these sorts of situations and really listening to the people who went through it um, and judging, okay, you know, was it just not for them or was this really a, a genuinely, uh, you know, harmful or abusive situation? I can't speak too much to the NBA. I'm not a big NBA fan and the empowerment of players through free agency and the ability to control where they go and when they go there has certainly changed the dynamics within sports. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm a bigger hockey fan and there are there are a couple different versions of hockey coaches. I mean, there are the super player friendly ones. Um, I'm a big New York Rangers fan. Uh, you know, Supposedly the last coach Gerard Gallant that the Rangers had was much more player friendly in that sense that he almost didn't have practices. It was more like, you know, okay, you guys go out there and and figure it all out. Uh, They had a really good one first season with him. The second season was disappointing and then he got fired. And this is basically the, you know, the pattern that has emerged with Gerard Gallant over time. Um, And then you have someone like John Tortorella, former Rangers coach. He's currently the coach of the Philadelphia Flyers. Well regarded as a disciplinarian, um, he's the kind of guy who is going to get in your face and he's going to yell at you. He's also going to yell at the refs. He was, there's, may have seen this incident where he ref, he got thrown out of a game, which is uncommon in hockey for the coach to get thrown out, and then he refused to leave the bench. It was like, wh- what do you do about a player like or a coach like that, a person like that, a personality like that? And my my current take on John Tortorella is that I love the guy and I don't want him any near anywhere near coaching my hockey team. But I'm glad that he is in the game. So you have different versions of that and you have a little bit different level of player empowerment in the National Hockey League. You're not as much in control of where you are or where you're going to be like players in the NBA can. But I think you've all raised an important point that players have an understanding of what Kim Mulkey is like when they are deciding to go to LSU. Um, I, going back again to the Herb Brooks and the 1980 Olympic hockey team analogy, if you've seen the movie or if you've read anything about the team, there's this famous incident that you know is still talked about to this day, the famous Herb Brooks bag skate, which is after tying, uh, I believe it was the Finnish national team uh, in, a, in a lead up to the Olympics, 
because of how poorly they performed and how uninterested they were in the game, Brooks made them skate what are in hockey parlance called Herbies now, which is you start at the far goal line, you skate up to the blue line, up to the other blue line, up to the far red line, and back each time. And according to the players, no one timed this. They believe they did it for about an hour. If you've ever just been ice skating with your kids or anything like that, think about doing not only that, but that at pretty much full speed for an hour. And it's dr- dramatized in the movie in this way that, you know, Mike Ruzioni, who becomes the captain, realizes the point that Brooks, Brooks is trying to push. That is like, they don't, they're, they're not individuals and they don't play for the universities that they came from. They're playing for the United States of America. And it's, it's dramatized in this great, moment. It's one of the things that makes the film so great. But even in its true sense, what Brooks was doing there was driving a point home to people who wanted to be on that team, who wanted to achieve greatness. And this was a guy who had done something different and was doing something different and realizing that if we play the way that Americans typically play hockey, we're never going to beat the Soviet Union. We have to hybridize schools. We have to take their own way of playing and we have to throw it back in their face. We have to change things. We have to do things differently. We have to be better trained than they are if we want to achieve greatness. And and I think that is my bigger point here, which is we have this increasing intolerance for people who do things differently, who are weird, who are eccentric. Like if you want to go back and I can't, I can't remember, was it, you know, um, was the inventor of, I can't remember if it was the phone or the telegraph. I read this about that. The real reason for their, them trying to invent it was they wanted to commune with the dead. Like the eccentric reasons people have for doing things that also may benefit society in some other greater way. We are so intolerant of people doing things differently Um, And this is, in a way, a a throwback way of approaching coaching because it has become so much more player friendly and so much more understanding of getting away from pushing people that hard and because of the, the harm that it may cause to those kinds of players. But as long as at the end of the day, like you've got voice and exit, you know, in in college, you don't really have a voice, but you do have the right of exit. You can transfer now um, very easily if you want to get out of that environment and go to a place where the coach is more player friendly. So I I don't know that I want to hang out with Kim Mulkey. I don't know that I want to spend a lot of time with her, but, you know, I don't really have a problem with her and her style being one of the options available to college women's college basketball players out there if they want that way of, of living and operating just the same way as, as Dylan referenced. If you want a certain kind of like structure and authority in your life imposed upon you, the military is absolutely an option for you. And, and I would just tag on just a couple of things. One is there's a big difference between what is described in this story and some of the things that got somebody like Bobby Knight fired. Absolutely. Like, Knight choked a player. Knight, Knight wiped his backside and threw feces covered toilet paper at his players. Like there was a lot of problems going on with Bobby Knight that went way beyond being hard on players, telling, you know, and I would even go so far. I mean, I think reading the story and and reading where what it describes in terms of her confronting, not even confronting, but talking to um, players that were gay and saying, just keep it out of the headlines. Don't, don't make that the story, right? Like that's really good advice for literally any player. Don't make your personal life the story about your career. Focus on the basketball. Let it be about basketball. Don't get distracted by this stuff. Um, so again, from what we can see, and I don't, I don't feel like I know enough to to make an ultimate judgment, but from what you see in the story, I think exactly what you're saying is true. And then the flip side of it is that we need places in society where resilience, um, where grit, where the, where the ability to kind of get through the other side of that of suffering or whatever, um, of 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 that sort of brutal environment is absolutely essential. Um, I mean, there, there's a reason why the Navy SEALs have not lowered their requirements. Uh, it, while requirements in the Navy for all kinds of other stuff have lowered because they've needed more numbers, there are plenty of Navy SEALs because people want to be able to say that they got through the training and that they achieved it and that they're proud of it. And they're never going to lower those requirements because those SEALs need the guys who who 
put on that uniform and 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 are able to wear the trident, they need to know that that guy can do everything that every other seal was able to do. Or that woman, if a woman ever makes it through the through the requirements. I mean, to this date, a woman hasn't because the requirements are brutal. Um, so so. Yeah, so I think I think all that to say, like we we need structures like this in our society, and and I think there's a there's a significant gap between violence, bullying, domineering, and demanding grit from people. Yeah, Mike, Mike, uh, I'm not going to stand for this uh, erasure of the documentary that I saw about a woman making it through that I think saw uh, star Demi Moore. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, with all apologies to the uh, squatter's rights uh, topic that we were going to address today, uh, we do not have time, so it's getting evicted from the show. Apologies to that topic. We will revisit it at a later point in time uh, because we have run long. But before we go, Mike, uh, uh, real quick, um, you both have a, a new book out and uh, a new podcast series out. Uh, why don't you tell us real quickly about them before we go? I was just going to let you know, I got a text from Squatters Rights. They're just going to stay here until, yeah, until, the- until we pick up the topic. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. That's the, that's the great thing about that topic is they don't go anywhere. Um, yeah, my book is called uh, Land of My Sojourn. It's uh, sort of a mix of spiritual memoir and reflections on um, the life of, of, particularly the life of Peter, dabbles a little bit in Elijah as well. But really what the book is about is what do we do with our, our experiences of spiritual disillusionment. There's a time right now, evangelicalism is going through kind of a crisis around this because of these leadership, these leadership failures. And, um, uh, yeah, so I, I wrote this, I wrote this book. That's, it's a short book that, but that's really sort of a, my story and kind of how I feel like God walked me and my family through that kind of a, a season. So it's available wherever you get fine books. Um, Marvin Alasky wrote a, a very wonderful review of the book for for Acton, um, and then we have two episodes left uh, that'll be coming out in April for this series called Promised Land, um, which really looks at the his looks at the the history of the Israel Palestine uh, question through the lens of the the post October seventh world. Uh, the next episode actually is a, a pretty interesting one where we really look at. What what is all this conversation about the third temple, um, the red heifers that are that are now in Israel? We talked to the red heifer people. It's a pretty uh, it's a pretty fascinating conversation. So that's that's the next episode, and then the final episode we'll be looking at uh, various various Christian perspectives on peacemaking. Let's call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes where you'll find a link that you can use to subscribe directly to Acton Unwind or just search Acton Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people can find this program. And I again want to encourage you to subscribe to our magazine, Religion and Liberty, where you can read not only Mike's great essay that we discussed today, but other great pieces by Anthony Bradley, our own Dan Huger, Jeffrey Paulette, Jean Edward Veith, and many more. Only $29.99 will get you four issues of our beautiful magazine in your mailbox four times a year. Look in the show notes for this episode for the link to subscribe. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to Dylan. A big thanks to Mike Cosper. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.